Welcome to Learn It Training. The exercise files for today's course are located in the video description below. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Hi everyone, welcome to Learn It's Microsoft Excel for Finance and Accounting Course Part 3. My name is Elissa Smith and I am an IT facilitator with over 25 years of experience teaching people like you how to maximize their skills in platforms like Microsoft Excel. Now in this part three course, our focus will be how to visually represent your data once you've actually created it and are using Microsoft Excel to keep track and analyze your data. We're going to learn how to use some of the charts that come with the software, like bar charts, spark lines. We're also going to explore pivot tables and pivot charts. Additionally, we'll look at ways to fix formatting in data before you analyze it. We're also going to look at how you can visually find insights inside your data. So please join us on this course. Looking to support our channel and get a great deal? Become a member today to unlock ad-free videos. That's right, your favorite courses without a single ad. Interested in a specific video? Purchase one of our ad-free courses individually. Looking for even more? Gain access to exams, certificates, and exclusive content at learnitanytime.com. More information can be found in the video description below. Hi, everybody. I want to show you one of the simplest and easiest ways to represent your data in Microsoft Excel. Now, there is a practice file for this. It's called Bar Charts. Remember, you can go into the description, click on the link to find the practice files that go with this course. How do you create a bar chart and what is it? Well, first of all, bar charts are also sometimes called column charts. They're useful for showing data changes over a period of time or for illustrating comparisons among items. In column charts, categories are typically organized along the horizontal axes and values are going to be along the vertical axes. So how do I create one of these bar or column charts? First of all, you need data, which we have. Then we have to decide what data we're charting. It's important to remember with charts, you generally want to select the simplest information. This means titles like we see up in cell A1, which is a merge cell. You don't want that because it's extra. And then down in row eight, I have totals. And if I were to chart these with my data, it could skew my chart results. So instead, I'm going to go to the simplest pieces of data, which will be cells A3 down to G7, and highlight them. This tells Excel what I want charted. Then to select a bar chart, I'm going to go to the Insert Ribbon tab and come to the middle of the ribbon, to the Charts group. Here you'll see on the top row that there is a column or bar charts button that you can click on, and it will show you the different subtypes that you can select. There are 2D, 3D, and even 3D bar charts. The column charts will be at the top, the bar charts will be along the side. Now to pick a specific chart, you hover over it and it will live preview what your data will look like if it is applied to this particular sub chart type. Once you pick the type that you want, you're going to click on it and you have a chart. This type of chart where it resides on top of the cells is called an embedded chart. Now charts are like graphics, so this means that if you come to the sides of them while you see their sizing corners turned on, you can actually drag them in and out to size them. I recommend doing it by the corners. Additionally, if you want to move your chart so it's not taking up too much space or over the top of cells, you can come to any side of the chart. You'll notice that your mouse pointer will look like an arrow pointing up, down, left, and right. You can just drag the chart to where you want it to go, and that way it won't be over the top of your data. When you click outside the chart in a normal cell, the chart will deselect and it will no longer be selected. So to select it, you just click on it. And again, now my chart is showing me the data that's currently in my table. And remember, the goal of charts is to quickly represent your data so that people don't need to actually see the spreadsheet. They can look at your chart and easily understand it and then go back to the data when they need more detail. So create a chart of your own. Welcome back. Let's look at another type of chart called an area chart. Now, area charts are similar to line charts, but the difference is that the area below the line is filled in with color in an area chart. And both area charts and line charts are great for showing trends, but if you're needing to print, it's better usually to do a line chart. Now, I have a practice file for this available. Feel free to use it. It's called area charts. First step is to select my data. Always remember, you want to select again what you're charting. And in this case, I don't need the title or row eight to be part of that. So I'm gonna highlight cells A3 through G7. 
Then I'm gonna go up to my Insert Ribbon tab and come to the Charts group. Now what's interesting about area charts is there really isn't a button representing them here. So if you come to the bottom right-hand corner of the Charts group, you're gonna see this very small rectangle with an arrow pointing down and to the right. It doesn't look like a button, but it is. When you click on it, it's going to take you into the Insert Chart box. You'll want to go to the All Charts button so that you can see, again, all the different types of charts you can create in Microsoft Excel. The left-hand side are the main categories. I'm gonna select Area, and along the top, I'll see the different subcategories. I can click on any of these subcategories to see my data represented in the box below. And if I hover, it'll zoom out on it, or I should say zoom in and make it easier for me to see. Once I find an area chart that I like, I can click on it and select it and then click on OK at the bottom of the box. And you'll see that the chart actually gets created for me. Again, I can size it. Now briefly, if you want to update this chart and change the way it looks, remember that in your chart, if you go to the top right or left corners, you'll see three buttons. The green plus sign is called the Chart Elements button. It allows you to quickly do things, for example, like add data labels to your chart or even add a data table underneath of it. The green paintbrush that you see when you right click is going to be the chart styles button. It's all about updating either the style of the chart, as you can see here, or if you go to the second tab at the top, you can update the color scheme of the chart. Just make sure that the formatting you pick for your chart does not, again, decrease its visibility. You wanna make sure that this chart is very easy for people to see and understand. Same thing goes for colors. Now the third button that you'll see in the top right corner is the filter. I love this one because it allows you to filter what's showing in your chart. When you filter, you're not deleting. What you do is come in and select an item you want to turn off and uncheck it. Then come to the bottom right hand corner and click on apply. Let me show you one more time what I'm talking about here. When you click on apply, it just removes that particular element from the chart. To return it, you're gonna go back up and re-click and say apply again, and it will come back. But remember, area charts are a great way to show trends. Hello everyone, let's talk pie and donut charts. There is a practice file for this called pie and donut charts. Feel free to use it to follow along. Now pie charts are really important. They are a great way to visually represent data as a fraction part of a whole, hence a pie with pie slices. They're also probably the simplest type of chart you can create in Excel. Now in my practice file to get started, I'm gonna highlight what I want to chart. It's going to be my headings, so A2 down to D3, and my top customer rep. So the cells I have selected are A2 to D3. Then I'm gonna go up to my Insert Ribbon tab and come to the Charts group. I'll click on the Charts button. You'll see that there are 2D charts, 3D charts, and donut charts. You can hover over any of them to see the chart get created. Once you've selected the type of chart you want, I'm doing a 3D pie chart, you click and your chart's created. Now, one interesting thing about pie charts is because they're so simple, you can actually adjust their range and adjust what information is being charted. To do this, I'm gonna make sure that my chart is clicked on and I'm gonna come into Excel and go to the right-hand corner of one of the ranges of cells that's being charted. And I'm gonna left drag. You'll see that my mouse pointer turns into a double-headed arrow. When I do this, it actually adjusts the range of cells that are being charted. And now, for example, I can chart Jose instead. Now for a donut chart, I'm going to click in a normal cell outside again my chart. I'm gonna highlight all my information, A2 down to D6, go back up to the Insert Ribbon tab, come to the Charts group, and find the Donut Chart subtype. Click on it, and now you'll see that I have a donut chart. Donut charts do a little bit better job, again, charting multiple rows of data, unlike a pie chart, so they are able to represent more complicated data. If you ever want to take a pie chart or a donut chart and edit them, remember you can use the buttons in the top right hand corner of your chart or on a PC you can go up to the contextual ribbons that come with charts called Chart, Design, and Format. These two ribbons have great tools like different chart styles and also the ability to update the layouts of your charts using the different tools that you'll see up in the ribbon. It's a great way to quickly, again, update the layout of the chart without changing the chart type. So try a pie chart and a donut chart. They're really simple. 
Hello, let's talk combo charts. There is a practice file for this called combo charts, so please use it to follow along. Now, a combo chart is a combination of two charts. So it could be a line graph and a column chart or an array chart and a line chart, but you can make a combo chart with a single data set or two data sets that share a common string field. We're going to use this, again, Excel spreadsheet to compare sales totals to commission fees. The first step is the same as all the other charts we've made. We need to highlight the appropriate cells that are being charted. Again, we're not going to highlight titles or totals. I'm gonna come in and start by clicking in cell A3 and highlight A3 over to C8. Then I'm gonna go up to my Insert Ribbon tab, come to the Charts group and look for the Combo button. It has a column bar chart, with again, a line chart on top. When I click, you'll see that there are three classic combo charts that you can pick from. We're gonna do the middle one, which is going to be the clustered column line on a secondary axis. I'll show you why. When I click on it, you'll see that again, I have the column chart behind with the line chart on top. I'm gonna make it a little bit bigger. Now, what can you do to edit this chart? Well, if you right click and come into the right click menu, you have a change chart type button. I so don't so much wanna change the chart type as let you see the options that you have here. When I click on it, it's going to show me my current chart. Again, you'll see down below that it's showing me what charts are being charted on which one. So right now my sales total is on my cluster column and my commission fee is on the line. If I'd like to switch that, Notice I can come in and I can change that myself by picking a different chart type and again, selecting a line for the top and you'll see it switches the information. Also here I can decide if I have a secondary axis or if I want them both charted on the same axis. Now that I've made that change, I can click on OK. Don't forget you can further update the way the chart looks by going up to the contextual ribbon called Chart Design. Come over to the Quick Layout button to try out different, again, quick layouts with your chart that may help you better represent the data that you're trying to chart. Once you've selected your chart type, click away from it and you now have a combo chart. Welcome back. We want to explore another type of chart called a waterfall chart. Now these charts are really great at showing a running total as values are added or subtracted. So they can be really helpful for understanding how an initial value like say net income is affected by a series of positive and negative values. The columns are color coded so you can tell positives from negatives very quickly. In our spreadsheet called Create Waterfall Charts, which by the way is one of the practice files you can use to follow along and make a waterfall chart of your own, we're going to be comparing income and expenses for the second quarter in an organization. I'm going to start by highlighting my information. It sells starting in A3 down to B13. Then I'll go up to the Insert Ribbon tab, come down to the Charts group, look for the Waterfall subtype. Now it's actually combined with the Funnel, Stock, Surface, and Radar charts. So you might have to look for it a little bit, but the Waterfall chart will be the very top option when you click on the main button. Once you select it, you'll see the beginnings of a waterfall chart. I like to make these charts bigger because there's a lot going on inside of them. So I'm going to make it bigger. Now you'll see that one set of bars will be blue. That represents positive values. And then my negative values are a different color. Now to be more accurate, I would like to have these actually be charted as negative because right now they're just compared to the values. To do this, I'm going to go to my first negative point in my chart and I'm going to click on it. When I do this, it selects all the data points in that series, but I'm gonna click again to get that data point highlighted by itself. You'll notice the other data points in the chart or the data fields don't highlight anymore. I'm then going to right click in the right click menu. Second from the bottom, you'll see set as total. When I do this, it gives a more accurate portrayal of where this negative value is in comparison to the positive values. And I'm also going to do the same thing with the additional negative value. I'm going to, again, click on it so it's separately selected, right click again and say set as total. And now I'm getting a more accurate portrayal of where the positives and negatives in my waterfall are happening. And again, once I deselect the chart, I'll see the colors become highlighted again. These are very powerful, again, for helping you see how an initial value compares to positives and negatives, and they are used all over the place. So try making one of your own. Hey everybody, we're ready to create what's called a football field chart. Now this is not a chart for keeping track of football scores. 
Football field charts are floating bar charts or stock charts from Excel that put several valuation analyses side by side to provide you with a full context of your company's value. They use a variety of methodologies and assumptions. So a typical football field matrix will include a company's value based on, for example, DCF valuation or LBO analysis. Now we're going to use a stock chart for our example today. And there is a practice file for this that I suggest you use to try this out. It's called Create Football Field Chart. Charts. So the first step is to select our data. And unlike the other charts we've created where we've selected column and row labels, we'll do that after the fact. So I'm going to come into my spreadsheet and highlight cells B3 over to E7. Then I'll go up to my insert ribbon tab. I'll come to the bottom right hand corner of the charts group to get into that insert chart box and go to the second tab at the top called all charts. This is where I'll find the different categories of charts. And of course, we want a stock chart. We're going to pick the second one in that's called open, high, low, close, and then I'll click on OK. Now I'm going to size this chart out just a little bit because this is the beginning of our football field chart. And when you see it sized, it does start looking more like a football field, hence the name. Now we want to continue to make some more changes. We want to get the correct labels down here on the bottom of the chart. So we're going to go ahead and just right click on any of the data bars. This will include the entire series, because when you click on one, you get all. We'll come down to select data. Now from here, I'm going to go to edit because what I want to do is get the correct category axes labels. These are located in cells A3 through A7. And these are, of course, the different various valuation methods that we're going to use. I'm going to click on OK. Now, once I click on OK again, we'll notice that they're added to the category axes. I don't need this legend anymore because it's not providing me with anything. So I'll click on it and hit delete. And then the grid lines, I don't need either. You could keep them, but again, they're just kind of making a extra space that we don't need. So I'll select them and hit delete as well. So now our chart's getting really clean and ready for us to add more customizations to it. All right, the next thing I want to do is add data labels to my chart to help show those highs and lows that we're trying to keep track of. So I'm going to click on any of the data bars to select the data series. And then if I go up to the top middle of the border of any of the data bars and click, I'll see that I get a small middle point. This is, of course, one of the data values that I can track in the chart or a data label. Now to format this specific data label, I'm going to come over to the top right hand corner of my chart. If it's too big, this button will appear in the top left corner and I'm going to click and come down to data labels. Now you'll see as I hover, it puts them on the top right side and I want to again control and put them in the top middle. So I'm going to click on the arrow at the side and actually come in and say more options. My format data labels task pane opens up over on the right. This will allow me to come down and place those data labels above the current data bars. I also want to format these as a currency. So I'm going to go to number. And of course, this will allow me to come in and pick currency for their format with two decimal places so that they're formatted correctly to make it easier for people to understand what they are. I want to do the same thing with the low point. So I'm going to close that format data labels task pane and come over and click on the bottom middle border of one of those again data bars and you get those same little markers representing the low point. Then if I come over to the green plus sign for the chart elements button again, I can go down to data labels. And again, you'll see that it's placing the data labels kind of off on the bottom right. But I'm going to go ahead and come to the arrow on the side, go to more options, just like I did previously. And this will give me the ability to open up the format data labels task pane again. And I'm going to select under label position below. Then again, I'm going to come under number and format them as a currency. Then I can close the format data labels box. OK, as we continue with our journey, let's format the data series. I'm going to come into my chart and click on any of the data bars. This will, of course, select them. If I right click again, I can go down to format data bars. This will open up the format data bars box. Let's add a fill color to the data bars. Remember, that's the inside, a solid fill and a color that's easy on the eyes, something that won't be too dark. Additionally, I don't want a border around the data bars, so I'm also going to come to border and say no line. This again simplifies things. I want to go to the chart title and I'm going to go ahead and add a chart title evaluation summary. Now I'm going to type it in my formula bar. And as soon as I hit enter, it gets added to the chart. 
Additionally, I wanna make sure that in my chart area, there's no fill for the chart area. And also, I want to make sure that if I do wanna fill, I could do a solid fill that is white, right? So that's another thing that I can do is come in and say just a white fill. Additionally, if I don't want a border around the chart, I can come in, go down to border and say no line. When I deselect the chart, we'll see how those two things have come into play as well. Okay, next we wanna format our axes. So I'm gonna come over to my vertical axes and click. You'll see that after I click, it will select the axes. And then if I right click, I can go down and say format axes. Now I'd like to set the minimum to 10 to just kind of help spread things out. And you'll see that as soon as I do this, it updates in my chart. Additionally, if I go back and click on the axes again, I'm gonna add a border just to separate the axes from the actual valuation. To do that, I'm gonna come in again, click on my axes to make sure it's selected so that I have the format axes box selected. Then select the paint count at the top, come down to line and say solid line. To increase its width, I'll come right here and make it maybe two points wide. And then also for the color, I'm gonna click on the color here and I'm gonna pick a gray color. Just let it set apart. When I click away from it, we can see that line is now in the chart. Okay, I wanna do the same thing with my category or X axis as I did to my Y axis. So I'm gonna come in, click on any of the items in my X or category axis, select it. If my format axis task pane doesn't open up, I can right click in the axis and select format axis. Then I'm gonna come up and make sure I click on the paint can at the top. This will allow me to go in and again, I wanna make sure that I have a line. I'm gonna pick the same color gray that I did previously make it two points in its width, and then I'll go ahead and click away from it so that now I have, again, two borders that are similar. It looks like one of them's a little bit different, but you wanna make them similar if possible so they kind of look like a line that's just continuous as far as those two axes go. Okay, we're just about done with our chart. I wanna to add to the title up here, Beyond Valuation Summary. I'm gonna click up in the title and also add to my title, Equity Value Per Share in dollars. And I'll just add this to the end of the current existing title that's there. Now to help really represent what the target reason for this chart is, for example, are you trying to represent a current share in this particular football field chart or a target price or a share price? So we're going to create a line to show that. So I'm gonna come over to the side of my chart after I deselect it, go up to my insert ribbon tab, come into shapes, and I'm gonna pick a line. I'm just gonna draw this line out with my, again, mouse. Then what I'm going to do is come in and format this line. Now I can use the format shapes task pane if it opens up. If this task pane doesn't open, right click on your line and go down to format shape. Now I'd like to make this line dashed. So coming into, again, the paint can side, Let's go ahead and change the color first. We want a solid line. I'm going to make it an orange color so it sticks out. I'm also going to increase its width. This will make it a little bit easier for people to see. We'll make it two points wide. And then of course, to change the style, you'll notice here that you can click on different ones. I wanna do a dashed line. And to make sure it's straight, we can just use the shift key and kind of pull it out. Then I'll bring it into my chart and put it where I want it to go, right here at the 40 point mark or the $40 share price mark, and then I can drag it out across the chart. And to make it straight, what I suggest is to hold down your shift key as you, again, drag the line out. If you ever wanna change the way the line looks, you can come back to the format shape menu. Here's the thing to remember about football charts, right? Their goal is to be a great way to summarize and visualize all of your valuation analyses. That's what these charts are for. And they do take a little bit of work, but once you understand how they work and what they can represent, they're very powerful. Welcome back. I wanna show you the smallest type of chart you can create in Microsoft Excel called a sparkline. These small charts fit directly inside cells in a sheet. Now, because they're condensed size, sparklines help you to see patterns in large sets of data in a very concise and visual way. They're great for showing trends in a series of values like seasonal increases and decreases or economic cycles, and they help to highlight maximum and minimum values. A sparkline has its greatest effect when it's positioned right near the data that it represents, and they're very easy to make. So I have a practice file for this called Create Sparklines. Feel free to open it up to use it and follow along. I'm gonna start by clicking in the cell where I 
want my spark line to go, cell F4. Then we're gonna go back up to the insert ribbon tab and come to the middle right of the ribbon to the spark lines group. Now there are three types of spark lines, line, column, and win loss. Now let me clue you in with win loss. It works best with highs and lows, so positive and negative values. We're gonna start with a line type of spark line and select it. Now it's gonna ask me what the range of cells is that has my data. I'm now gonna highlight cells A4 over to E4, and then I'll click on OK, and voila, you have your spark line. Now when you click on the spark line, you will see that there is a contextual ribbon that you can use to edit your spark line. The right hand side has sparkline styles. These basically change the color, but on the far left, you can actually edit the range of data that you're editing or creating your sparkline from, and you can change your line sparkline to a column sparkline or a win loss sparkline. In addition, you can also highlight different points in your sparkline using the show group. You can edit to show a high point in a different color, and for example, a low point in a different color and the sparkline editing contextual ribbon will allow you to do this. Let's also try out a high low sparkline. For this, I'm gonna go click in cell F8. This is where I want my sparkline to go. I'll return up to the insert ribbon tab again, go over to the right hand side to the sparklines group and select win loss. Remember, this one is for highs and lows or positives and negatives. I'm gonna highlight my data A8 over to F8 and then click on OK. And here you're seeing an example of a win loss. Again, even with the win loss, I can highlight specific points within the spark line. So for example, if I wanna make one of the bars turn a different color, I can do that by coming to the marker color and picking the specific point I want to edit. Now the only downside to spark lines is when it comes to deleting them. You cannot click on the cell where the spark line is located and hit delete. It will not go away. So to clear a spark line, if you click on the spark line and go up to the spark line contextual ribbon, the very last button in the right hand corner of the spark line ribbon is a clear button. It gives you options to clear selected spark lines, which is what I want to do. And this is how if you click on a cell and you go in and select clear selected spark line, it will delete the spark line out of the cell. These again are a very small, simple way to reveal patterns in data and I love to try them on rows. Hi, I wanna talk about one of my favorite features in Microsoft Excel, it's called a pivot table. Now the value of a pivot table is that you can use summary functions in value fields to combine values from underlying source data and it allows you to take a large data set and analyze specific columns out of that data set without having to worry about having to reformat, hide columns and rows, and messing up your source data. There is a practice file for this called Create Pivot Tables. Please feel free to use it to follow along. So here I have my spreadsheet called Create Pivot Tables Open. How can I make sure that when I go to make my pivot table, this will work? First of all, let's look at row one, super important. I have column headers. These are especially critical when you're creating a pivot table. Second of all, I don't have any entire blank rows. Now blank cells are fine, but entire blank rows will stop your analyses at the point where you hit the blank row. We're ready to create a pivot table. Now remember, the goal of the pivot table is to allow me to analyze parts of my data, not all of it. So say for example, your supervisor comes to you and says, hey, with this data, I would like to know the total sales by commission for each destination. Well, think if you had to do that on your own, it would require tons of functions and also sorting and filtering. So a pivot table can do it for me in just a few clicks. The first step is to click anywhere inside the source data and then go up to the insert ribbon tab. Now, if you've never made a pivot table before, I highly recommend checking out recommended pivot tables. This box will actually take your data. On the left-hand side, you'll see examples of pivot tables you could build from your data. And in the middle, you can actually preview them. Remember, my idea was to see, again, the sum of tickets sold by destination. And you can see that right here, I already have that separated by commission. And when I click on OK, this recommended pivot table gets put on its own sheet right here. My source data is back on my original sheet, totally unimpacted by the pivot table I've just created. This time, let's make a pivot table on our own. Again, click anywhere in the data. We're gonna go back up to the insert ribbon tab, and this time we're gonna to come to the far left button. Now this is one of those double buttons. The top half is actually gonna take you directly to the insert pivot table box. The bottom half lets you pick where your data is located. 
We're gonna go ahead and just click on the top portion because our data is right here in the spreadsheet. It is not uncommon to have your pivot table data be in a different workbook file or even a different file source. Right here, you're gonna see that it's already assuming the range of data. This is why those entire blank rows are a no-no. And you could reselect this, but Excel knows exactly what my data is because it can find it. Then the default is to have your new pivot table be placed in a new worksheet. Perfect, I'm gonna click on okay. So now I'm in a new sheet and you'll see on the right that a pivot table field list has opened up ready for me to build my pivot table. Now, a very common mistake that newbies make with pivot tables is to click in a cell outside this pre-built pivot table area. When I click here, everything turns off. Just come back over and click where you want your pivot table to go. Now to create your pivot table, what you need to do is take fields from the top and drag them down to your pivot table area down below. The top portion of the pivot table field list are those column headers that I mentioned at the beginning of our video. So what I need to do is pick the columns that I want to analyze. I'm gonna start by taking my office field and dragging it down to the rows area. I'm just going to left hold down my mouse button and drag it down. As I do this, I'll see my pivot table get built in the middle over on the left hand side. I'm gonna go ahead now and take another field and drag it to the columns area. Now in the middle, I need to pick again, some field that I can summarize in the middle. So it works best to use value-based fields. I have three columns that have value-based information, amount, tickets, and total. I'm gonna go ahead and drag total down. And you'll see that there are a lot of blank cells in my pivot table. These blank cells are just as important as the cells that actually have information, because these tell me when something didn't happen. So again, I'm not analyzing all the data from my source data, just three specific pieces. Now you'll notice that for the summary function, it always defaults to do a sum. Let's say that I'd like it to do an average. I can right click right here where it says sum of total, or I can actually left click right here next to where it says sum of total and come in and pick value field settings. This box will allow me to pick from a variety of Microsoft Excel functions like average, and I can change that summary function and it updates. Let's say that I would like to format these as a currency because that's what they are. I'm gonna right click again, come down to number format, and I can pick a currency instead. And again, having the correct format helps people to understand that this is an amount of money that someone bought. Now, how easy is it to manipulate pivot table data? Let's say that I don't wanna see my destinations here anymore. I'd like to see them on the rows. I can take destination off of the columns area, drag it under the rows area, and now I'm seeing a pivot table where they're both stacked together. But notice again, everything's alphabetized and I'm even seeing subtotals and at the very, very bottom, I see a summary function. The other value of pivot tables is how manipulable they are. They're very easy to update and change and you can build as many of them as you want. One final caution with pivot tables. If you go back to your source data, nothing is updated. But let's say it does. For example, some of the number of tickets sold change and you'll see this will change the total. If my summary data changes, unfortunately my pivot table does not automatically update. It's critical that if you do have updates in your source data, when you go back to your pivot tables, you need to refresh them because they don't auto update. To do this, you're gonna right click anywhere in your pivot table, come down and select refresh. This will ensure that the pivot table is updated to its source data. Pivot tables are very easy to make and they're a very powerful way to quickly analyze big sets of data. All right, guys, one of the reasons that pivot tables are so powerful is because they allow us to create pivot charts. There's a practice file for this called create pivot chart. Feel free to open it up to follow along. Now, why would a pivot chart be so important? When I have a large data set like this one, if my boss comes to me and says, hey, can you chart this? If I try to do that, notice this is what I end up with. The problem we have in a data set like this is there are too many columns to chart. Microsoft Excel does not know what to pick. But if I can create a pivot chart, just like a pivot table, it allows me to select specific pieces of data out of this wide data set and just chart those pieces of data. So how do we do that? Well, first of all, remember, you need the same setup. Column headers, no entire blank rows. Then we're gonna click anywhere in our data and we're gonna go up to insert. 
We're gonna come over this time to the charts group and on the right hand side, you'll see the pivot chart button. Again, the bottom half of the button lets you decide if you're going to do a pivot chart. The second half will ask for both a pivot chart and pivot table, but they end up taking you to pretty much the same place. So we're gonna just click on the top portion. This will open up the create pivot chart dialog box. Again, the first step is to make sure you have the correct range selected and then select where you want your new pivot chart to be built. We're gonna do ours in a new worksheet and then click on okay. So a new sheet opens up and we'll see right here that the new thing that's been added is there's now a place for a pivot chart. Rather than a pivot table field list on the right, I have a pivot chart field list. And rather than columns and rows, I have legends and axes areas. But the top is still going to be the different column headers from my data. The steps to build the pivot chart are very similar to the steps to build a pivot table. I need to add the fields that I want in my chart. I'm gonna start by taking destination to the axes, and then I'm going to take ticket sold and put it on the values area. And notice I already have a chart. Now, as I showed you previously, I could not chart the data set in my promotion sales sheet. It was too wide. But with the pivot chart, the pivot table allows it to bridge the gap in the data. Again, I'm able to focus on the data I want and then chart it. And this is super cool. Let's say that I want to add office to the legend. And notice that as I do this, my chart updates with this information. There is a pivot table behind, and if I come in and I update my pivot chart, watch what happens to my pivot table. I'm gonna take office and drag it down to the axes and take the destination off. Notice as I do this, the chart updates, the pivot table also updates. Now, can you edit a pivot chart? Not as much as a normal Excel chart, but let's look at a few things you can do. If you come to the top right-hand corner of your pivot chart, you'll notice that you have a chart elements button that'll allow you to do things like add data labels and even data tables if you want. And also the paintbrush will give you different pivot chart styles. The great thing about these is we're not changing our chart type, we're just changing our chart style. And don't forget the color tab that will allow you to apply a different color palette to your chart. The important thing to remember with pivot charts is that they always update to their data. So if promotion sales updates, I'll need to remember that I'll need to right click on either my pivot chart or my pivot table and refresh so that my pivot chart and my pivot table are always up to date with their data. But these are very important and for many users, the reason for their pivot tables is their ability now to chart data that previously they could not. Hey everyone, super important topic, sorting and filtering your data in Excel. We also wanna talk about sorting and filtering data in a pivot table. There's a practice file called sorting and filtering. Feel free to open it up to follow along. Now let's just start, how would I sort and filter this particular spreadsheet? A lot of people will highlight the cells they want to sort and filter by, but again, the problem with that is you can separate your data. Right now, each of these pieces of data is like a record per row. I wanna keep it together. How do I do that? Well, what I like to do is go up to the data ribbon tab, and come in and come to the sort and filter group on the middle right. There's a large filter button. It looks like a funnel. When you click on this, if your data has column headers like mine does, it automatically adds the auto sorting and filtering arrows. Now these arrows allow you to both sort and filter. Let's start with sorting. I can go to any column, click on the arrow, and at the top I have an ascending and a descending sort. And notice how quickly that allows me to keep each row together, but sort it. Now to do a filter, I can come in and I'm gonna to go to the commission arrow this time, click on it and notice down here at the bottom, I can just uncheck the item I don't want, check the one that I do, and it filters just by that item. Notice the little funnel next to the column header. To turn any of these filters off, I can either go to the particular arrow where there's been filtering applied and say clear filter from, or up on the same data ribbon tab in the sort and filter group, there's a clear button that I can click on to turn it off. Now let's talk for just a minute about some of the custom filters you can do. Say for example, on my amount column, I only want to see the amounts over $500. I can click on the sorting and filtering arrow, come down to number filters, and I can do what's called a custom auto filter. I only want to see amounts that are equal to or above 500. I'm gonna click on okay. And then if I want to, I can come in and also do an ascending sort 
and I can see that I'm only seeing when the amount of tickets sold is over 500. To clear this filter, I'll come in and click on the clear button again. Now in this same practice file, there are pivot tables. If you go down to the sheet called sum of amount by des hyphen off, it'll open up a pivot table. How do I customize the sorting and filtering in my pivot table? Well, first of all, in any pivot table, if you have columns and rows, you'll see that those same auto sorting and filtering arrows are available in both the column area and the row area. And I can use these to change the sort from an ascending to a descending sort. Notice now that if I look at my columns, they're sorted from, again, right to left in a descending order or Z to A. And if I go to my row labels, I can do the same thing. Again, now I'm doing in a descending sort. When it comes to filtering, those same arrows, if I come in, I could filter and say, I only want to see anything that begins, for example, with a letter N. Notice that what it starts doing is looking for anything with an N in it. If I add a wild card, which is an asterisk afterwards, it deselects everything except, in this case, again, my row items that begin with the letter N, and it filters everything in the pivot table by that criteria. To turn off the filters in a pivot table, I can come right here again to the row or column label where the filter's been applied, come in and say clear filter from, and the filtering turns off. A final thing that you can use in pivot tables for filtering is an overall filter. In my pivot table field list, you'll see there's a filters area we haven't yet addressed. I can take any field from, again, my pivot table fields, drag it down to this pivot table filters area, and above the top left corner of my pivot table, I will see, again, an overall filter that I can run for my entire pivot table, where it allows me to filter for one item inside my entire pivot table. If I'd like to use the filter and have multiple items available to me, I can come right here and check off select multiple items. I'll check off all the different items I'd like to filter by, and then again, my pivot table will filter for those specific items. To clear, again, an overall pivot table filter, you just go up again to the auto sorting and filtering area, come in and just you want to recheck the select all button and you'll notice that then you're back to having the ability to do the filter but have the filter turned off in your pivot table. Very powerful tools that can be applied inside a pivot table or as we showed you on the promotion sales sheet just to a normal set of data. Final thing, how do I turn these arrows off if I'm in a normal data set? To turn the auto sorting and filtering arrows off, you just need to go back up to the data ribbon tab to the sort and filter button, click on the filter and they turn off. So there's something that you can turn on when you need them and turn off when you don't. Hey everybody, let's talk regression analysis. Now regression analysis is a statistical method used to estimate, again, the relationship between a dependent variable and independent variables. You're basically assessing the strength between the variables and it can be used to model future relationships between them. To use this tool, you need a data analysis tool pack installed in Excel. There's also a practice file for this that you can use called regression analysis. Our first step is to make sure that we have the data analysis tool pack installed in Excel. So for this, I'm gonna come into desktop Microsoft Excel, go to my file ribbon tab, and come all the way to the bottom left corner to look for the options box. Remember, this is where your defaults for Excel are. On the left-hand side of the Excel options box, I'm gonna come down to add-ins. Once I go to add-ins, I'm gonna look at the list of available add-in parts of Excel. These are things that are not installed by default in the platform. The top one is a tool called the Analysis Tool Pack. It's not the Analysis Tool Pack-VBA, just Analysis Tool Pack. At the bottom, you'll see that you can click on the Go button. And this is gonna take you and have you check off the analysis tool pack. I've already installed it, so that's why I'm seeing it already checked off in this list, but I'm showing you this process so you can make sure that the data analysis option is available for you to use. I'm gonna click on okay. Now, once I've installed the tool pack, what I'm gonna see is that when I go to my data ribbon tab, on the far right-hand side of the ribbon, I'm gonna have a new group called analyze. On the Analyze ribbon, there will now be a Data Analysis button, and this is what we will do to run our regression analysis. So when I click on this button, there are several different statistical analysis tools that come with this, but I'm gonna come down and select Regression, and then I'm gonna click on OK. 
Now for just a moment, let's talk about what regression means inside of Excel. Basically what we're doing again is we're estimating or we're going to see how close and how good the relationship is between two or more variables. Well, notice in my spreadsheet that I have the number of flu cases and then the number of associated flu vaccines that were done during the same time period. These are two, again, variables that are different but very closely related. So my regression analysis, again, what it's going to try to do is help me to predict, again, the relationship between these two variables. In the regression analysis box, the first thing I need to do is input my Y range. That's going to be the number of flu vaccines. So I'm gonna come in, delete what's here, and actually insert the correct cells, which is C3 through C15. Notice the absolute, again, references it's doing on the cells. My X input is going to be the flu cases. Now the other two boxes I'm gonna check off is that I do have labels and that I need to have an output range. This is where it will actually list the analysis that it's gonna do for me. So I can actually click right here on this scroll up button and click in the cell. It's gonna be for me cell A18. That's where the analytics report will go after I'm done. Then I'm gonna go ahead and expand the box back out, making sure that everything else is set up the way I want it to and I'll click on OK. And this is when the magic happens. All right, now that we can see the output, we're going to take a minute and briefly go through so you can understand. Again, there's a lot of statistics here, and if you're not a statistician, this can be a little bit difficult to understand. I wanna start here in cell A18 with my summary output. And if you need to widen some of these columns, sometimes when the regression analysis comes in, everything's kind of scrunched together. So the first thing you need to know is that the multiple R, correlation coefficient is gonna be something that measures the strength of a linear relationship between two variables. The larger the absolute value, the stronger the relationship. So what we're seeing here is anything that is closer to a positive one is going to be a more positive relationship. If it's a negative one or closer to a negative one, it means it's a negative strength of relationship. Zero means there's no correlation or relationship at all. And when you come down, you're gonna see the R square. This signifies a coefficient of determination, which shows the goodness of the fit. And notice that ours is about 0.96, which is an excellent fit. This means in other words, that 96% of our dependent variables, our Y values are explained by the independent values, our X values. So this means that really with the adjusted R squared, that we have a very good correlation and relationship between the information that we're, again, doing statistical analyses on. Now, going down a little bit further in the report, you're gonna see that you have an A Nova section down in cell A27, depending on where you've put your, again, output. A Nova stands for analysis of variance, and it gives you information about the levels of variability in your regression model. So you're gonna see here that there are different pieces of information that are shared. DF is the number of degrees of freedom associated with your sources of variance. SS is gonna be the sum of the squares. MS is going to be the mean square. And F is going to be the F static or F test for full null hypotheses. Then you're gonna see here that this significance F, and let me spread this out a little bit so it's easier to see is going to be the p-value of the f. Again, a lot of statistics involved here. Now you can also graph this information and there are some scatter plot charts inside of Excel that can help you to chart this information. So back up in my data, I'm gonna highlight cells A3 all the way down to C15. I'm gonna go up to my insert ribbon tab, come to my charts group. Now right here there is a scatter chart or bubble chart option that I can click on you'll see that there are different options. I'm gonna hover over a few of these so you can kind of see which ones might be better for your data that you have. And notice that as I go through these, you'll see that a lot of them are going to allow you to see the information plotted together. I'm gonna to pick this very first one, which is the scatter chart, right? And I can see that it's going to, again, show me the correlation between these two pieces of information in my chart. Keep in mind that you can change the chart type at any time. For this, I'm gonna go up to the chart design ribbon, come to change chart type. And say, for example, I only want to see maybe the flu vaccine side of my information. I can do that. 
And even more than that, if I pick a point on the chart, I can right click on a given point of the chart and I can add a trend line and that will also help me to see what that trend for the flu cases is in my chart. So again, regression analysis is very complicated. It requires a lot of statistical knowledge, but in its basic core, we're trying to see if two, again, variables have some sort of relatability to each other and the strength of that relatability. And with the regression analysis, we can do that. So please try it out. Hi everyone, what if you just have a spreadsheet and you want to analyze it, you're not sure where to start? There is another tool that you can use called the Analyze Data button. It's available in Microsoft 365 and Excel desktop. It's a fairly new tool, but the idea is it actually will help suggest questions to help you analyze your data in different ways. So you'll see there's a practice file for this called Analyze Table. Feel free to use it. I'm going to zoom in just a little bit to make it easier to see my data. Then what we're going to do is we're gonna come in and highlight the data, which is all the cells, a1 down to H19. On my home ribbon tab, I'm gonna to come to the far right hand side to the analysis group and click on the analyze data button. A new window opens up called analyze data. It does all kinds of things. It suggests pivot tables I could insert. It suggests charts that I might want. And again, this is just based on data that it's finding inside my table that I have. You'll see at the bottom, once it runs out of room, it has 22 additional options that it could create for me. Now at the top, it even suggests possible questions I could ask and it will create pivot tables for me based on that information. I can come in and also type in a question of my own. Like I could say average of income. Hit enter and it will actually show that for me or to me. And if I click right here on insert pivot table, it inserts a new sheet for me and puts that information on the sheet. If there are other suggestions in the analyze table box that you'd like to use, you can clear a previous search, find one of their suggestions. For example, right here, I have an income chart. I can come down and say insert chart. It inserts it into my data and allows me to use it. So the idea is that I can take these analyze data suggestions and actually use them to help me Again, understand my data and it's built right into the platform. And all I have to do is click on one of the options and it will put it again into my spreadsheet for me. So I don't have to come up with these ideas. They're created for me just by again, coming into this tab. Now, sometimes they're useful, sometimes they're not. But the more you play with this, the more options it gets because it actually watches the types of questions that you ask it and it actually learns. So the more you use it, the better it gets. Sometimes the information isn't so good at the beginning, but it will get better with time. Notice up here at the top, there's a little arrow that will allow you to move it. You can actually undock it and bring it into your spreadsheet if it's easier to work with it in place. And when you're done with it, click on the X and it will close. Hey everybody, let's say you want to create a stock chart or a stock graph. These, of course, are used to display the trend of a stock's price over time. Some of the values that can be used in these charts include opening price, closing price, high, low, volume. They're very beneficial for visualizing stock price trends and volatility over time, and they're really pretty easy to make. There's a practice file for this called Stock Chart. Feel free to use it. The first step is going to go ahead and select my data, cells A3 down to D21. Then I'm gonna go up to my Insert Ribbon tab and come into the Charts group. You'll see kind of on the top right or on the right-hand side that you have, again, the Waterfall, Funnel, Stock, Service, and Radar chart options. I'm gonna click on this. There is actually, a again, a group of charts called Stock Charts inside, and you can hover over these to kind of get a feel for what they'll look like with your data. With the data that I have, the first one, which is High, Low, Close, is the one that I'm going to use because those of course are columns B, C, and D in my data. I'm gonna select them and then again, I suggest coming to the edges of the chart 
and dragging them out a little bit to make them bigger. Now with this chart, there's some additional things you can also add to help format it. And I also suggest playing with some of the different elements that you can add. For example, I would like to add a trend line to the chart. So I'm going to click on the chart so it's selected and come to the top right or left button and look for the green plus sign. This will take you into the chart elements box. And one of the things you can do is add a trend line Notice it will let you pick what series, high, low, or close to do it for. I'm gonna do it for the high. Now I can also actually format this trend line by clicking on it. And if I come up to the format ribbon tab, I can do things, for example, like change the color of the trend line. I can also come in and make it wider by again, updating the style of the trend line. There are also going to be different chart styles. So if you click on the chart, and come into chart design, you'll see that there are different chart styles and some of these are gonna represent the chart data in a little bit better way, easier to see, and might make again your stock chart look a little bit more visually appealing. And then don't forget that you can also come in and update the color scheme of the chart if you want to do that. It can also help make it a little bit easier to see some of the data points on your chart. But creating a stock chart is really fairly easy to do. So give it a try, just ensure that you have the right kind of information. Hi everyone, let's talk about Purchase price variance. Now this is important because it leads us into building our own pricing variance tables. And PPV or purchase price variance is one of the beginning topics when it comes to this. It's also involved with PPV finance. This is the difference between the purchase price and the actual cost for a good or service. And it's called purchase price variance analysis. It's important because it measures how much a company spends on goods and services. And again, this really affects the bottom line and profitability of an organization. It's also critical to inventory management because you want to purchase items at a good amount and not have too much or too little in your stock. So how do you calculate this? Well, we have a practice file and there's an example of the formula in the practice file. The practice file is called creating a pricing variance table. And you'll see that in a black box, kind of by cell A9, you'll see how to do PPV. You're gonna take your standard purchase price for an item, subtract it from your actual purchase price, and then divide it by quantity. So let's try it out. I'm gonna click in cell E3, and I'm gonna hit an equal sign. Now, I want the first part of this formula to happen first, so I need to put it in parentheses. I'm gonna take my, again, standard purchase price, subtract it from my actual purchase price, all in parentheses. Then this will be divided by the quantity and I'll hit enter. Now, if it's not formatted as a percentage, I should say come up and make sure you click on the percentage button. This is a formula that you can drag down. And again, you can see that where you have a positive price variance, it's a positive value. Where you have a negative price variance, it's a negative price variance. And you want it to be positive because this shows how the company is saving money. There are a lot more facets to this topic and other parts of pricing variance that you can calculate. This is just a beginning example for you to try out. But again, a very important topic to help you understand the bottom line and profitability of your organization. Hi everyone, thanks again for joining us for this part three of our Microsoft Excel for finance and accounting. In this course, we've explored lots of different ways to create charts like bar charts, combo charts. We've even looked at how to create a football field chart and a stock chart. In addition to that, we've explored creating pivot tables, pivot charts, how to create regression analysis in a spreadsheet, how to use find insights, create a trading chart, and the beginnings of a pricing variance table. Now, please join us for our Microsoft Excel for Finance and Accounting Part 4 course, where we're going to go in and look at how to create your own income statements, set up balance sheets, and even do income statement forecasts. Thanks for watching. To earn certificates and watch our courses without ads, check out learnitanytime.com.